Okay, welcome back everyone. Thank you for braving uh, the snow this morning. Um, we are in the last mile here. Um, we have three more lectures. I'll be adding a 27th lecture uh, after our discussion on cyborg technology. We're going to switch today from looking outward to looking inward, but before we do, let's talk a little bit about the final project. Um, hopefully you are preparing your second interim video, which is due tomorrow at 11.59 p.m., and you're going to be showing us a little bit of user testing. How did your user testing go, go so far? Uh, I was wondering, so basically I was kind of just giving my computer Exactly. And not saying anything. That's right. And so, like, Hopefully so your new user knew to look at the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can I like give you just context of like this is teaching the ASL digits, like that's it? Because won't a user in real in real life like know that they're signing on to a program that's gonna... I, I think that's reasonable. I think for this we kind of use common sense, right? You can sort of tell them what it's for, but not how to use it. That's that's the key. I took footage uh, of my father, and it was like horrible. <laughs> it, was, it was like, what is this thing? So if it's really like- This is why we timed it for the Thanksgiving break. Hopefully you can try it out on older members of your family, yeah. which are a very good test is demographic. It's really bad, like if they don't understand it like, at all. Absolutely. Is that a group of like, okay, this is what I need to fix? Yes, okay. and that's what we'll be looking for in your third uh, interim video, which will be due next Wednesday. We want to see somewhere in there, and again, it doesn't have to be long, just a nod that you've tried to change the interface given what you experienced with your, your user testing. If we had more time, we'd have you do another round of user testing, but what we're looking for in the interim videos is that obviously you're putting in some of your own creative ideas about how to make your system more usable for a wider range uh, of users, and that you've learned something from user testing and that is feeding back into your system. You'll remember back to uh, towards the beginning of the semester when we talked about the process of uh, design for HCI. We had sort of this star pattern, and at the center of the star pattern was user testing. If you go and work in a production house on any software that's going to be that's going to be exposed to the users, if you deal with any aspect of the front end of a large-scale system, you do a lot of user testing, right? And one of the interesting things about user testing is often what you thought was intuitive turns out to be non-intuitive and vice versa. Did anybody have that experience with their users? More or less? Okay. So it's also a learning experience, not just obviously for your users, but for you. So we're looking again in interim video two, not that your users had a perfectly smooth interaction with your system on the first try, but that you are capturing these moments in which they're confused, frustrated, or surprisingly e at ease with this particular aspect of your system, and then addressing that in interim video three. All good, any question, questions about the interim videos, final project? So far so good? Yes? So when you say sign 10 digits in a row, frankly, does that mean you're gonna display 10 different numbers in a row? This, this is an example, right? So this, this is just following this example of, in this case, this hypothetical, uh, this hypothetical student decides to show sequences of digits and then the users have to sign it. Two, three, four, five, six. Or 674312. Just again, that's just an example. That may not be what you're actually doing. Any other questions? Okay, so back to lecture. And again, it's been, it's been a week, so let's reorient as to where we are and where we're going. We concluded uh, before the Thanksgiving break this long section on looking outward. This is a great time to be studying HCI. And for you, those of you that go and work in a software production house, it's a great time to be working and actually developing HCI because our society is in the process of stitching technology into the real world, right? 10, 10 years ago and 30, 20, 30 years ago, we figured out how to build these things called computers. We figured out the internet. Now we're figuring out how to expose all of these devices directly to the real world. So we talked about embodied cognition, situated cognition, machines that are drawing data directly from the real world. And in the case of robots, are able are starting to be able to move about 
in the real world. And as they do move about in the real world, they have control over the kind of data that they receive, right? Very, very different from a laptop that sits passively on your desk and waits for you to type something or waits for a packet to arrive via the internet. So uh, we're in the process of instrumenting technology into the physical world. At the same time, we are getting better and better at creating virtual worlds, and more and more of us are spending more and more time in those virtual worlds. So that's what we're gonna look at in Looking Inward. We're gonna to spend today talking about virtual reality where we enter to some degree into a virtual world. We may finish lecture 24 today. We may start lecture 25 on augmented reality where we have a human observer who is viewing and possibly moving about in the real world. And as they do, we are layering virtual reality on top of physical reality to give us augmented reality. And in lecture 26, we'll look at a different form of inward facing technology, inward literally into or under the skin, into the human body. So what happens when we have a human nervous system talking directly to technology and possibly the technology speaking back directly to the nervous system and skipping over our five senses, right? In virtual reality, and augmented reality, whatever you're looking at, it is over or on the skin, cyborg technology under the skin. That's the distinction we're gonna look at today. Okay, so let's talk about looking inward. Uh, as we're, uh, before we do, just to sort of set the context again, um, you remember back, you hopefully remember, back towards the beginning of the semester, we were looking at when we were talking about interactive uh, systems design. We were talking about trying to design software that is not just correct and bug free, but has these additional non-functional requirements. They're not related specifically to the function of the software itself, but these more general and somewhat vague properties like the system should be accessible, usable, acceptable. And the last one we looked at is the most subjective of them, which is engaging. So if we're creating a computer game, for example, it should be not just bug free and accessible to all and easy to figure out how to play the game, but it somehow draws the user in. They feel engaged or immersed inside that world, right? We've had virtual reality for a long time. It's called books or theater or music or culture or art. Now we're figuring out how to do it with technology, but what art and virtual reality, which we're gonna look at today, all of what all those things have in, pro in common is they're able to pull someone into that virtual world, right? Art's been around for a long time. It's very popular. Computer games are becoming increasingly popular. So there is something about the human psyche that loves this process of being pulled into these virtual worlds, right? We love a good story. We love a good movie. Um, we love a great piece of music where we lose ourselves in it. So for the, the why of virtual reality, why do we go about building it and why is it so engaging to so many people is we have this desire to be drawn into another world. That's the why. If we do want to try and create real, virtual reality, then we can switch and start to think about the how. How do we create virtual reality that's engaging? If you remember back to uh, I forget which lecture this was, a lecture, our lecture in cognitive psychology on mental models. If we want to try and create an illusion, what distinguishes virtual reality from all the art that's gone before is that we're going to actually try and put the actor, the observer, as a participant, an active participant in the virtual world. Typically when you read a book or watch a movie, you're sitting quietly, you're sitting still, you're interacting with the story in a minimal way. You're moving your eyes and saccading across the page or across the movie screen, but otherwise you're passive. Virtual reality systems are trying to engage more and more of your sensory and motor systems. So how do we build a mental model of a story or a computer game? If we're gonna be active, we are going to move in some way and our mental model of the virtual world which we feel that we are experiencing, that mental model predicts what the sensory repercussion to our action is going to be, right? 
As far as I know, I'm in the physical world right now, and if I take a step to my left, my mental model of the visual scene in front of me predicts that all of your heads will move one step to my right, right? If I'm wearing virtual reality goggles and I take one step to the left, what I'm seeing on the inside of the goggles, what does my brain predict is going to happen to that visual scene? Same shift, right? So the scene that is painted onto the monitor on the inside of the VR glasses is going to have to shift to the right. How do the glasses know to do that? They're going to have, somehow, the virtual reality system is going to have to sense my movement, right? So we're back to a social robot, if you like, where the human moves, the output of the human becomes the input to the technology, in this case, VR goggles, and then the VR goggles output something, changes the visual scene, or makes a sound, or vibrates, does something else, which because it's being worn by the human, becomes the input to the human, and around and around and around we go, right? The interesting thing about virtual reality, of course, is there's lots of different ways that I can move and interact with the physical world. How many of those can be sensed and captured by a VR system? And for how many of those actions can the VR system give me back the sensory repercussion that I expect. Tricky, right? Some are easier than others. If I'm wearing goggles and I move, that's relatively easy to capture as long as there's an accelerometer or something that detects motion in the, in the goggles, that's gonna be relatively easy to capture. What is much more difficult to capture? Touch. Touch, touch. absolutely, right? So unless I'm wearing gloves, VR gloves, that's gonna be a little tricky. What else? What's more tricky than just head motion? Smell. Smell, that's, that's going to be tricky, yeah. Uh, motion in any other part of your body. Walking, right? We're going to look at walking. I see a virtual world in the inside of my goggles, and I want to walk through that environment. I start walking in the real world. How is the VR system going to, to deal with that? Yes? Responsive sound, that's going to be tricky as well, right? So when we, we're going to look at a number of VR systems today, and as we do, I want you to keep this cartoon in your mind. Your brain, or the person who's wearing the VR system, their mental model is going to be making lots of predictions for different sensory systems. As I move around, not only does the visual scene move, but I hear my boot falls in the background, right? There's a lot of different things that are going on. Some of them are a little bit ob more obvious than others. So our brains are making predictions about sensory repercussion for lots of different kinds of action. Head movement, body movement, touch, reaching, grasping, uh, and so on, smell, another good one. And then at the same time, we're also making predictions about those repercussions. So repercussions across lots of different sensor modalities or across our five senses. And most importantly, our expectations have a timestamp associated with them. We have an expectation about how soon we're going to receive that response. One of the things that's made VR so tricky for so long is most of our predictions are in real time. If I were to move and to the left and my visual scene moved to the right a tenth of a second later, no good, right? It's happening in real time. From my point of view, there is absolutely no lag in my movement and the sensory response to that action. That's true for most of the actions I can perform in the physical world, but not true for all of them. Where are there some actions where I actually expect a lag? An echo. An echo, absolutely. This room is actually a good example for that. There's a slight echo in this, this room. What else? Kind of related, but like sound over distance. So the further something away is, shut a car door, like you expect to hear a second thing. Absolutely, right? So most VR systems, they're projecting a 3D scene onto your retinas. So we have an expectation about the three dimensional world, absolutely. Okay, so tricky, right? We're making, uh, we're making predictions about lots of different kinds of actions across different sensor modalities at different time lags, or in a lot of cases, no lag at all. 
how much of those expectations can a VR system meet? Okay, so that's the how of VR, very tricky. And we're doing it to try and match this why. We're trying to cast an illusion. We wanna make a world in which someone feels drawn into it and lost in it. In the videos we're gonna to watch today, you'll hear them talk about breaking the VR illusion. You feel that you're in the real world, you put on the glasses, the glasses haven't been turned on yet, you're still in the real world, you turn on the glasses, and if things are working, at some point you no longer feel that you're in the physical world, you're in the virtual world, right? What needs to happen on the VR side, on the technology side, to create that illusion? That's, that's what we're looking for today. Okay, so again, before we talk about video game, uh, before we talk about virtual reality, to begin with, let's start with computer games. This is pretty, pretty amazing phenomenon. Back in 2016, um, games brought in $100 billion in revenues. Compare that with Hollywood in the same year. So the most popular movie in 2016 brought in 1.1 million. The next one, 1 million. If you sum the top 20 uh, movies from 2016, it's nowhere near computer games, right? There was a few years back where revenues from computer games surpassed movies, and now it's, I think, double, it's beyond that, right? So there's something about computer games and this idea of engagement, losing yourself in the system, that is increasingly attractive compared to our current state-of-the-art system or our then state-of-the-art system for creating virtual worlds. Pretty, pretty amazing. Yes? Are those just straight dollars? They're not like hundreds of dollars? Or... That's, uh, what is that? That is 1.1 uh, billion. Captain America brought in 1.1 billion. Still not bad, right? Okay. Okay, so we're gonna watch uh, a minute, uh, a video in a moment, and we're gonna look in that video at five different VR systems, and these were sort of state-of-the-art prototypes in 2016, uh, so they're already two years old. Uh, when you watch this video, all five of these, they're more or less promotional videos, so the uh, demonstrators of these systems, they're gonna be much more vocal about the advantages of these systems. They're not gonna advertise the weaknesses of these systems. I want you to pay careful attention to these five systems and note down the pros and cons of these systems, specifically as they relate to which aspects of the user's mental model do they meet and which ones do they frustrate. And again, some of these are easier to see than others. So for example, you'll see in all five of these that there is a, a goggle system. And when the user moves their head, the scene moves in the opposite direction in real time. So that meets our expectation of head movement and movement of visual field, right? That, that makes sense. That one's easy. Some of these systems try and capture other aspects that are more difficult to capture. So look particularly for those subtle aspects of sensor motor coordination. I push against the world and I expect how the world is gonna push back. How many of those subtle expectations are met or frustrated? Those are the tricky ones to capture. Okay. Okay, I don't have any sound, just bear with me for a second.
Today we're checking out VR treadmills that are either currently on the market or under development. These devices add locomotion to the VR experience, designed to increase immersion. Let's check them out. Catwalk is a new omnidirectional treadmill input device. The main problem Catwalk solves is to move within a small space in reality and achieve limitless and continuous movement in virtual reality. With its built-in and wearable sensors, you can literally walk, run, backwards, jump, crouch, and sit in the virtual world. Different games call for different movements. Catwalk allows you to switch actions anytime you want. You can even sit down to drive or fly when a game requires it. We started the project since 2013, and we have made quite a bit of prototypes. During developing and testing, we noticed that in many games, you want to perform different actions with your arms and legs. It was annoying and disappointing if these movements are constrained. And while in a virtual world, you can't see the real one. If there are devices near your arms and legs, you may hit something or get hurt. The Creative Catwalk independent support structure and open construction sets your arms and legs free. First, it is very easy to get in. Without a ring or column surrounding you, you can move freely and securely without constraint or worry about hitting anything. You can swing your arms naturally or put your hands to rest down by your sides, getting closer to a natural walk posture. Catwalk has not just simply removed the column and the ring. Our unique design can limit the horizontal moving range and control the vertical movement function while walking and running. It can automatically provide 35 cm vertical moving range while jumping, crouching, and sitting. Meanwhile, it can help users move back to center to adjust the position offset while walking, which can increase the sense of balance and safety. When we walk in real life, friction is what propels us forward. Frictionless walking is awkward, like walking on ice, if you must pay attention to keep balance. Catwalk uses high friction material surface and uses a constant force of rolling friction to simulate real walking forces and human motion. This makes you feel like you are walking on real ground instead of sliding walk. With normal friction, it is easier to keep balance and it will decrease the time it takes anyone to learn to use Catwalk. Catwalk uses a lower cambered base to transfer potential energy to kinetic energy and to reproduce the movement locus. All of this is to achieve a more natural feeling of walking. You can use it to enjoy relaxing virtual reality games or applications in a comfortable way. Just sit back and relax. Our software can transfer body motion to keyboard or gamepad. This means all the games with keyboard or gamepad support will be playable. We are also developing our own SDK and demo to achieve analog movement and independent walking and looking direction. The prototype you see here is kind of big. This was made to prove our brand new solution. We already have all the plans to make it smaller and lighter. Okay, we'll see the others in a moment. What are some aspects of sensor motor coordination that are met and some that are frustrated here? So you can, like, you could move in any direction, like, and they don't, you can't, like, bump into something that isn't there. Okay, so you can move in any direction and not bump into anything. That's good. So there's no obstructions. You don't have any visuals of your arms or legs? You don't have any? Any visuals of your arms or legs from what I can tell? Uh, that's true, right? So there's just the the the, uh, the goggles and the harness that you're wearing. So nothing directly detecting arm position or hand position. Um, it can detect uh, crouching and sitting, which I think is like really impressive compared to most other omnidirectional systems. Yep. Okay. There was a mention here that you can walk in any direction. Can you? We can't walk backwards. We're in the frame. You can't walk backwards. Or there's just a limit to how much you can. Okay, possibly. You, like from, so from what it looks like, you can't actually like fall in the step. Like you can't put one foot off of an edge and then fall because that would, it doesn't go with the. Right, so that's a good trade off between safety and realism, right? So you can fall in the real world, but maybe not a good idea in VR. It, it seems like with the wheel down on the shoes, you can like step to the side. Ah, uh, so the wheels on the on the soles of the shoe, if you saw that in the video, right? These high friction rollers 
on the soles of these special shoes that you wear so that when you step and place your foot in front of you and pull back towards you, your foot, your leg feels resistance, right? Which is what happens in the real world. The sole of my foot, unless I'm on ice, holds still and my body rocks over my planted foot, right? So you feel that according to this this system, even though you are not moving forward and putting your weight over your foot, it's the other way around. Your foot is rolling backwards towards you and your center of mass is staying in the same place. Makes sense, right? You wanna try and keep the user more or less in the, the same place, but it means certain motions like walking to the side are not going to work in the system. Maybe that doesn't matter too much. Absolutely, right? So if in the virtual world there is a virtual barrier, the harness that you're wearing can enforce a physical version of it, right? So it feels like you've actually hit up against a barrier in the virtual world. There's some more subtle interactions here that are also frustrated by this system. Sure. Right, until we figure out the holodeck, right? Actually, <laughs> completely free movement is going to be tricky. That's, that's fine. You couldn't do something like reach behind you or jump too high because those are still constrained by that bar. Exactly, right? So your motion is constrained in a relatively limited volume. Let's go back to walking for a moment. You all have years and years of experience walking. As you walk, and you're probably not conscious of this, you will be after this class, what are, this, what are the body cues that you're receiving as you walk that are frustrated by this system? Uh, air resistance. Air resistance? How so? Um, you're actually taking a step in the real world. Yeah, so you would feel like air hitting your like, face and your arms and stuff. Okay. Like yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, As you're moving through the world, there is a subtle flow of air. That's true. Yep. Yeah. Maybe that's detectable. Your body is rocking back. Absolutely. So your body is rocking forward and back and you're wearing this harness, which is hard to see from this video, may or may not constrain that motion. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be for change in elevation. Change in elevation. Exactly. As you walk along flat ground, what do you expect to sense as you do so? As you're walking uphill, what do you expect to experience? You change kind of like your center of gravity a little bit. So you like move and tilt forward or Okay. You yep. Feel the you, you feel the incline, right? And if you're walking up the side of this bowl, maybe people are rocking forward. Remember the cartoon I showed a few minutes ago? If I jumped up to somewhere higher, I would expect to land sooner than the time it took me to reach like the it's like I would jump and then I would reach the peak of my jump and then I would land somewhere higher up and I would expect that to take a shorter amount of time, but it won't. Exactly. So there's an issue, there's a lot of issues here with timing in relate in relation to locomotion, right? So as you jump up onto a step or a block, you expect to feel uh, to expect to feel pressure on the soles of your feet earlier than if you jumped on flat ground. Right? What about walking? Forget jumping for a moment. Walking on flat ground, walking uphill, walking downhill. Doesn't this device have kind of rims to where you're walking around? So you're gonna feel this all the time when you walk. Ab the ground is flat. Absolutely. So if you go back and watch this video, you'll see in most most of the cases they're walking or running on flat ground. But in reality, they're walking uphill all the time, right? They're taking a step and their foot is landing on the rim. So they're it's like when you stumble on steps. Your expectation of when you're going to feel pressure is thrown off, and if you've ever had that experience on, on stairs, it's very frightening, right? That's a pretty important signal um, when that particular expectation is frustrated, the timing in terms of footfall. I would imagine, I haven't tried this device myself, I would imagine it's a little scary at the beginning because you're not quite sure about when you're going to step down. Now again, the brain is pretty plastic, it probably adapts, but one of these examples of what makes VR so challenging. Okay.
everyone here, and thank for uh, thank for coming to our office. It's a big week for us. This week we delivered the first Omni. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of where games have always been trying to take you. They always talk about immersion and trying to actually put you in the game. Well, you can't just do that with only a console and a controller and a TV. It is immersive, but yet you know you're still sitting on a couch. Hopping on something like the Omni, where it just it puts you in the game and you it's like you're suited up to get into the battle. I have an extremely bad problem motivating myself to do exercise. Yeah, I broke a sweat in like that short amount of time. It's gonna really get the heat turned up in here, I don't know. Getting to enjoy that physical interaction of running and moving and looking and not feel so detached from the world that you're playing in. Oh, it's night and day. I have told people for years, if I could walk across Skyrim, I'd be more fit. And this is exactly that, that machine. I was like, oh my God, somebody actually made that thing. I mean, I'm not much of a shooter. I just want to go explore a world, go running in, you know, a world full of dragons and magicians and whatever. The biggest thing right off the bat is the lack of sickness. So far, all of my experiences with seated VR, like I have motion sickness stuff, and I had none of that here. What I loved about it is you're actually playing with people. The last demo I tried was single player, and you kind of walk through this uh, corridor, whereas this one was a little bit more wild because I had a partner there right next with me. When the bad guys get close to you, you instinctively, like, you move your body away from them. You react. My head moved, and it moved, and my whole body went with it, and it was cool. I could have this in my living room with my rock band equipment, and I think that's really exciting. The virtualizer consists uh, of three main parts. Okay. Uh, the base plate with a low friction surface, uh, the pillars, and the ring construction. There are linear guides in the pillars that allow for smooth and quiet vertical movements. This is necessary for crouching and jumping. And in addition to that, the ring construction allows the user to turn around and rotate 360 degrees. We felt that rotating inside of the second prototype wasn't as smooth as we wanted it to be, so we decided to improve the mechanism of the reconstruction. Furthermore, we also refined the sensor system that detects the rotation of the user. We have also changed the linear guide system inside the pillars, which is now smoother, more quiet and more durable. On top of that, the new system is lighter than the previous one, so we have saved some weight. Okay. Um, another major improvement is the material that we use now on the base plate. For us, it is very important to have natural walking and running inside the device. So the friction coefficient is now on a level which is ideal for natural movements. Um, when we started developing the virtualizer, we made some experiments with different shapes and also made a motion analysis in the laboratory. And we've also uh, tested the different shapes in action. And we've realized that the flat base delivers the best immersion. Now, if you use a bowl shape, your feet will touch the slope of the bowl earlier than you would expect, creating a discrepancy between what you see and what you feel. Uh, this breaks immersion and pulls you back into, the, into reality. Stability is very important for us, so we decided to use three pillars instead of two or just one. The reason is that three pillars absorb the forces of the momentum caused by the user better than two or just one pillar. Okay. And since you're able to sit down in the virtualizer, uh, we have to make sure that the construction supports the user's weight. Um, speaking of sitting function, Obviously, you have to be fixated inside the ring um, to perform moves like uh, jumping and crouching and also, of course, to sit down. Does the user have to carry all the weight of the ring construction as well while he does so, or do you have a solution for that one? Um, we have a special construction in the pillars, in the linear guides, okay. which compensates the whole weight of the ring construction, so the user doesn't have to carry the weight and doesn't feel anything of the ring construction. Okay, so one thing you notice about the new prototype is that you've constructed a black bar which is hanging above your head now. Could you maybe explain the reason for it being there? 
Sure, yes, we call this black bar VR and it is constructed because of head mounted displays and earphones which are wired. Okay. So you can guide the cables over your head and don't get disturbed in the virtual world. Okay. And it is designed that way that you can still aim upwards without tossing against it. I see, so it's for completely unrestricted. Absolutely. Okay, I see. Okay, Luther, I think that's enough for now. Thank you for taking your time off to show us the virtualizer. You're welcome. Welcome to Infinidec, a true omnidirectional treadmill. Infinidec uses motorized components and a simple belt connected to a sensor to track and respond to your movements in real time. Infinidec's belt has multiple bands that change direction, allowing you to go in any direction at your own pace, freeing you to explore your virtual reality environment naturally and safely. Infinidec revolutionizes virtual reality movement, giving you the ability to quickly change pace, stop and go, crouch and pivot, providing a truly immersive experience. With our technology, you can feel like part of your favorite game or jog through exotic countryside while at the gym. Infinidec makes the future possible today. Imagine training simulations that prepare you for urban warfare let you practice tactics on foreign terrain, or even walk beneath the stars of another world. Infinidec's omnidirectional treadmill technology makes it possible for you to be fully engaged in the VR world while keeping you safely in the center of the treadmill. There is no limit to where you can go. Last one. <clears throat> Sometimes simple is best. Okay, I think you get the idea. Okay, pros and cons. If you walk up to something and try and touch it, it's not yeah. there. Why would it be broken? Because like, missing. Like if you're walking up to something and you try and touch it, it's not there. Why would it be broken? Because like, if, missing? Like if you're walking up to something and you try and touch it, it's not there. Why would
Like the guy with the um, walk, walking around that like the with the Infinidec, and you like walk up to one of those posts, and he was like reaching out with his like controller or whatever. But, like you reached out and you tried to act, and you like touch, put your hand where you thought that, that would be. You'd expect to meet some resistance, but instead you're just waving your hand around. If you were to reach out and try and touch an object in the virtual world, you would expect to feel resistance, but of course in the real world there's nothing there. How might we deal with that? <coughs> oh, do you, do you have an idea about that? Let, let's stick, right, go ahead. So of course there's different components here, right? So the VR systems are meant to be modular. So first of all was the goggles to deal with sensor motion and vision. We're primarily visual creatures. So again, not surprisingly, that was what was tackled first. That technology is reaching perfection, more or less. Next is walking, where we are mobile creatures, right? Then the next frontier is reaching, grasping, manipulation. So we can create VR gloves. How are those going to help us? If you have like haptic feedback in the gloves, then you can feel resistance or pressure when you reach out and touch things. Absolutely. So we could have haptic resistance. We could have special gloves that provide vibration, perhaps, to give a signal of resistance. There isn't anything yet that's going to physically restrict your motion, right? Just to signal that you are touching something. Is there another option other than gloves? How could you give the illusion that you're touching something without requiring the user to wear gloves or hold a controller? You have nothing in your hands. Ultra haptics. Ultra haptics. Exactly. If you remember that system that was producing uh, that was producing um, uh, ultrasonic. Uh, beams from above and when they met at certain positions in three-dimensional space those waves would produce positive interference and increase uh, the resistance there and you can actually feel it in the air. It feels like you're touching a virtual object. Imagine if you were to connect ultra haptics with a goggle and treadmill system. You could start to approach manipulation. But again manipulation is, is tricky. I saw a problem with the uh, Infinidec where there was like movement after you stopped moving. Uh, so also when the individual crouched, the treadmill moved a little bit. Um, yeah. Exactly. So Infinidec has an obvious advantage, which is that you're actually moving, right? In the other four systems, your center of mass stays where it is. You put your foot out there and pull your foot back towards you, which is not what happens in reality. If you're on a treadmill, you are free to move your center of mass in a certain direction, and then the tread treadmill under you will pull your whole body back to origin, right? A severe, a great advantage, but it comes with a cost, which is the lag, right? You feel that motion of the treadmill slightly after you've start initiated the motion. That's an interesting idea, right? So these haven't tackled incline or decline yet. They could. Let's let's focus on the treadmill for a moment. This is an interesting case. With the treadmill, like, so you didn't have to shift your center of gravity, but all of them, it looked like they were still leaning against the resistance of the thing that was holding them in place. Okay, so maybe there's a little bit of, uh, there's some complications there with the rig that they're wearing. Let's forget that for a moment and let's focus just on the treadmill. Let's take what we've learned in HCI about packed analysis. We want to think about physical context. In this case, we're th thinking about physical context of moving. A human walker is walking around in the physical world. They're giving off lots of cues about how they walk. We need to detect those cues. We need to sense that, send those signals to the treadmill and get the treadmill to move in the right direction at the right time. There's always going to be a lag, but maybe we can get that lag small enough that it's not detectable to the mental models that most people have when they're walking. There's still a lag in, uh, in goggles, but it's low enough now that for most people they cannot detect it and they do not get motion sickness when they're wearing VR goggles. What are the cues 
that a human gives off when they're walking about where they're going and at what speed? Uh, uh, angle of the head, angle of like the hips. So let's angle of the head. What about angle of the head tells you where the person is about to walk? Normally you like look where you're going to go. Physical context, right? Most of us, we turn and look. If we're going to change direction, we turn our heads before we turn. We could take head motion data, which we're getting from the goggles, and use that to improve the response of the treadmill. What else? What other signals are coming in about where the person is about to go? So the treadmill, the system may be able to support running. That may be a functionality you want to try and capture. Challenging, because now you've got high speed motion. But there are unique cues that the person is preparing to transition from walk to jog or trot or run. Looking down and shifting weight a little bit forward. Assuming that, again, from the harness, we're getting information about body posture, we may start to ratchet up the speed of the treadmill because the person is starting to accelerate. Assuming that there is like pressure sensors on the bottom, like with the other ones, then you could kind of see like how they're distributing the weight on their feet. Absolutely. So the, the relative pressure in the soles of the feet, where pressure is on the soles of the feet, is very indicative about twisting, turning, shifting weight, I'm about to jump, I'm about to crouch, I'm about to walk, I'm about to run, I'm about to stop, and so on. How does the treadmill itself work in mechanics? How is it omnidirectional? <clears throat> belt's going one way on top of my, I would say, there's one big belt, right? There's one global belt that is moving in one direction. We'll call it the X direction, right? And the belt of that large treadmill is made up of a series of smaller belts, which are moving orthogonally. Let's call that the Y direction. And each of those individual treads, if you go back and watch the video, can be moved at different velocities. So it's not a uniform motion which is good because again, you can just move where, where the treadmill can move just where the person's foot is. But again, the real world doesn't quite work that way. Kind of an interesting mechanical system and then also <coughs> interesting from an HCI point of view. Uh, I don't know if it's worth mentioning, but it seems like from the treadmill, um, that you would be able to keep track of the direction without having to calculate from the head full part. And those might be some tough calculations to do the du the direction that they're moving you mean yeah mm -hmm. yeah um, and especially if you want to run and look to the side tricky yeah uh, absolutely. So obviously a big, a big, big challenge here. You could imagine massive user testing and all the different ways that people might move through a virtual world. You've got a massive amount of training data. There's a very interesting machine learning problem to be solved here. Given the current head position, body posture, pressure from the feet, uh, sensor, uh, sensor data coming back from the harness, what direction and speed is the user going to move in the next tenth of a second, second, two seconds from now, and so on. Not an easy thing to do, but maybe not, not impossible. Okay. So I mentioned some of the other ones here. I mentioned in passing motion sickness. Anyone try any of the earlier goggles? So why do people get motion sickness with goggles? What's the problem here? When your brain tells you that you're not moving, but then your eyes are telling you you are moving, or vice versa, then it gets, uh, you don't, your, your body doesn't like that. Your body doesn't like it. Same reason why some of us get car sick, right? This was not something that our brains were evolved to deal with. Our ancient ancestors never had to deal with treadmills and moving cars and so on, right? When I move, the, the rest of the world moves. Typically, the rest of the world is not moving when I'm stationary or when I feel that I'm stationary. Okay. What about the last one here, Roper? Simpler design. Pros and cons. It was simpler. One of the cons is that like it wasn't really, we weren't really walking, it was more like a shuffle. Right, right. 
And again, for a lot of users, maybe that's good enough, right? It, we're, we don't need to create a perfect uh, illusion. It depends on what we're, we're trying to do. OK, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, let's talk now about the goggles themselves. Again, this has more or less been solved, but kind of an interesting HCI problem as well. We need to, again, think about physical context and physiology of the visual system. So here's a diagram of a hypothetical uh, head-mounted display. Um, and this is for calibrating head-mounted display. Um, most goggles have a left screen and a right screen. But because, again, physical context, we're wearing the goggles, those screens are very, very close to the eyes. So we've got two very small real screens mounted directly in front of the viewer's eyes. And we need to use optics to create larger virtual screens at a further distance away. What do they mean by that? Where your eyes see light, manipulate that to change the way you see it. Right. So when this is working, when you put on the goggles, you do not see two screens directly in front of your eyes. You see some other scene which is further away from you. How do they create that illusion? How does it look to the wearer that the scene is actually further away than it actually is? Uh, they use lenses to manipulate focal length. They use lenses yeah, like, for the focal length. Yeah, that's that's important. What else? If you are creating the graphics that are going to be painted onto this uh, blue screen, the left blue screen, and the right. Uh, the, the, sorry, the left real screen and the right real screen. What graphics are you going to draw to help cast the illusion that they're actually looking at something that is further away? So if I was going to wear goggles at the front of the, the room here, you could take the view from my point of view, cut it in half, and paint this half of the room on the left screen and the right side of the room on the right screen. Will that work? You can probably tell by the way I'm posing this question that it won't. Why not? Absolutely. There's some, there's some overlap, right? So I am looking at all of you with both my eyes, and there is significant overlap. What can you tell me about that overlap? Absolutely. So when I'm looking at any one of you, I'm actually seeing very slightly different views of your head with both eyes, right? So it's not just overlap, it is also slightly different views. And if you get that just right, if someone is looking at an actual 2D screen or a pair of screens very close, it will cast the illusion that they're looking at something further away. It is actually, if you put the right pieces in place, it's not as hard as you think. What is inside this picture? It's a bunch of eyeballs. Just a bunch of eyeballs. Not quite. So for those of you that have done this puzzle before, there's a trick to see the hidden object. What is the trick? You can, you can move up to here and then walk further away. There's an easier way to do it where you don't have to leave your seat. Just relax your eyes. Relax your eyes, okay. When you relax your eyes, and again, we want to be very specific about the visual system. When you relax your eyes, what happens? You're changing your focal point, exactly, right? So your, your pupils, I'll leave that up for you to give it a try. Relax your eyes. Don't look at the screen. Look through the screen. I don't know how it looks from your point of view. You might have to look a, a couple of feet beyond the screen. When you relax your eyes, you'll no longer be looking at the screen, but you'll be focusing on a point behind the screen. And when you do, you will see, anyone managed to do it yet? 
No. Oh. It may be because it's on the screen far from you. Maybe you do need to be closer. Okay, well you can try it at your leisure on your laptop with the screen a little bit closer. I won't tell you, I won't give away the surprise. No one can see it yet? What's that? A clue as to what's inside? It's another giant eye. Not, not that exciting, but there you go. Okay. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. You can play these, play these at your leisure. There's a gazillion of them on, on the web. One of the tricky things with goggles is you need to detect not only head position and orientation and acceleration, you need to be able to detect the position of the pupils in the user's eyes. Where are they looking and how far away are they looking? So in this uh, top-down display, you can see if the pupils are more or less parallel, if you took lines emanating from those pupils, they would cross at a very far distance away from the eyes. They're looking at something far into the screen, and you would have to adapt what the images you're painting on the real screens to bring into focus that distant object that they're looking at. <coughs> Not this one, not back to this one. Someone is wearing these VR goggles. Where are they looking? What are they looking at? They're looking at the little images, but, but from their point of view, they are looking at a larger scene, the one that's behind these two screens. Actually, this might help. Here's just a screenshot of what you see from virtual glasses. Uh, and you won't be able to do it because you're not wearing them. But if you look carefully, obviously there is a fair bit of overlap between these two images. These are the two images that are drawn onto the real screens. If you're wearing these, they overlap and it looks like you're looking at this actual scene, but you see it in 3D. You'll notice not only is there just simple overlap, but the objects are rotated slightly relative to one another. Because again, when I'm looking at one of you or when you're looking at me, your two eyes are seeing slightly different angles of my head. Same thing with the objects in this scene, right? So you're seeing this, but the user who's wearing these goggles is seeing a scene that's much further away in 3D. The, the user shifts saccade, their saccade. They are looking at this object, which is close, and then their pupils change. And it turns out that they're actually looking at that object in the back. Right? You might need to bring one or two into focus or maybe move the whole scene. If they move their head and rotate their head, we need to rotate the scene. Other objects need to rotate at different speeds. It gets tricky. I'm just curious, do you know how they figured out the exact angles of your eyes and, or what the difference is? Sure. I'm different, different goggles have different solutions, but it's an easy one. You have a small camera sitting, sitting on the inside surface of the goggles looking back at the user's eyes. It's a pretty easy computer vision problem because you have a field of white with something dark in the middle. You remember when we talked about social robots and we talked about joint attention? There was a robot that was actually looking at humans' eyes and was trying to detect what object the human was looking at. Same thing here. Not too difficult. Okay. You might also remember, uh, we looked at a video by Johnny Lee where he had, um, he had a Nintendo Wii remote that he was wearing on his head. And as he moved his head, the scene on the screen moved in opposition, right? If you're looking through an empty window and you move your head, the scene that you see through that empty window, through the frame of that window, changes, right? You can play all those same tricks with uh, the Google, uh, the Google, uh, the glasses. Yes. Does this break if you like go cross eyed or something? Good question. I don't know. I haven't tried it. Um, probably yes. So then, someone who has like a lazy eye or something might not be able to use. How do we support people whose visual system deviates from the normal functioning of a human visual system? Absolutely. 
Okay, I think in the interest of time, we'll skip over, um, let's see, how much more do we have here? Yes, in the interest of time, we will skip over um, Google Cardboard. This is a great one, because as, as, uh, as long as you have a smartphone and some cardboard, you can try this out uh, yourself. It's not sophisticated, but it's got some of the basics that we've already talked about with stereoscopic uh, vision. Um, pretty, pretty neat idea there, Google, uh, Google Cardboard. If you do try it out, play the same game we did with the five VR systems, what aspects of visual repercussion when, uh, in response to head motion is supported or frustrated by Google Cardboard? Has anyone tried it out before? A couple people. How was the illusion? Not bad, so-so. Yeah. Better than you thought, okay, there you go. Okay, so uh, we've talked a lot, uh, sort of a, a little bit about the cutting edge of VR. Let's go back in time to virtual worlds. Uh, the very first virtual world uh, was a multi-user dungeon or MUD created in the late 70s uh, in the UK and it was all text. Right? Again, we've had books for a long time, so virtual worlds were actually, if you go back and look at the history of video games, were a pretty smooth progression from a story in text to what we have today, right? The graphics are nice, but not necessary, not necessary. Okay, so let's look at a few virtual worlds now and think about what might be the killer app. So we've been promised VR for a long time. Um, we now have pretty sophisticated computer games. What can we do with them other than, than play a game? Those in academia have thought for a long time about how we might use VR to improve the learning experience. Uh, I'll show a bit of this video. This is a promotional ad from Ohio University that built a virtual version of their university in Second Life. And I will switch back to my other machine because this has some sound. Not great sound, but some sound. Would have been nice to fly to campus this morning, right? Most of us have dreamt of flying. We've dreamt of a world with endless possibilities where reality falls away to be replaced by imagination, creativity, and endless opportunities for discovery. Discovery, so central to learning, has now broken free of the boundaries of the classroom. Learners now thrive in an environment unbridled by space, time, or even the laws of physics. Welcome to the Ohio University Second Life Campus, an engaging new universe of learning opportunities for intellectual and professional growth. An immersive atmosphere where the classroom has not just been recreated, but rather reinvented. Learning experiences can range from entire college courses to one-hour learning modules. Learning comes in many forms. Learning kiosks are scalable systems for housing course content for blended or standalone delivery. Each kiosk houses applicable course content in a variety of possible media forms, from text to video, podcast, and more. The campus also contains substantial space for virtual trade shows and conferences. Second Life conference exhibits are a highly cost-effective method for ongoing contact with your customers. Art and music is alive in the Arts and Music Center, where artists, filmmakers, and musicians from Ohio University and all over the world display their talents. The Campus Student Center is where real-world student activities are enhanced by the rich collaboration made possible by Second Life. At the heart of Ohio University and Second Life is the same mission that drives Ohio University in real life, a complete dedication to the learning outcomes of our students and industry partners. Don't just dream of flying. Spread your wings and explore the Ohio University Second Life campus, where discovery is limited only by your own imagination. Okay, discovery is limited only by your imagination. 
you could have rich interactive experiences in the virtual Ohio University, like facing each other and typing on virtual keyboards. I think conceptually it's there, but like execution may be lacking. How so? So I think like the idea of a virtual education and being able to like have like that experience would be great, but like I feel like in 2018, those graphics are like relatively unacceptable and like you know what I mean? All right, so we take that system and we update the graphics to 2018 levels. And, and we expose the students in the virtual campus to a campus building where you go inside and there's an internet kiosk with a virtual screen inside and virtual buttons and some professor sitting in his office lecturing at you. I would put facial expressions and face-to-face -face interactions that probably doesn't work in this Again, this one's a little bit dated. We could update that. Not to pick on Ohio University, but again, we have this brand new technology and it's difficult to think about the physical and cultural context of learning, right? So we could, for example, create the same old standard approaches to education in a virtual system, but we're kind of missing the whole point here. What aspects of physical, cultural, and social interaction are missing from this particular virtual world that would facilitate learning. What's missing from what's happening right now that would help your learning? Eye contact. eye contact, I can't maintain eye contact with all of you in parallel, right? So the professor avatar could meet with the student avatar and assuming they had facial expressions, maybe it would be easier for me to maintain or have one-on-one -on -one interactions with you more often rather than you making the five minute walk out to Feral for one hour a week, possibly. You're what else? Like a 2D slideshow versus in VR and you could theoretically have you know, which they do have in Second Life, right? Or World of Warcraft, where we're gonna host our, our classroom, right? It is a virtual 3D world. It may not feel like it unless you're wearing goggles, but if we do have a three-dimensional environment, what could we do other than create another virtual lecture hall and have all the student avatars sit in virtual desks and listen to the virtual professor? This is kind of tangent a little bit, but I read recently in the news that there was a professor of history that was teaching Show rather than tell, yeah. absolutely, right? So if we're, if we're dealing with physical artifacts, architecture, art, it would be great to be able to show rather than tell. That's one of the possibilities that virtual reality may afford in an educational setting. You would need some like pretty impressive like chatbots or else the experience isn't gonna be personalized to you. Assuming that it, there isn't someone on the other side of the avatar you mean. Yeah, correct. right. Okay, so we could try and automate things again, right? And maybe we would need a sophisticated chatbot. Like, um, this seems like a good idea um, for students with like physical disabilities. Um, in a space like this, it'd be hard to get around campus. Possibly, so if you can't make it to campus, exactly, reaching uh, students that have limited uh, uh, mobility, absolutely. What else, what are some of the other opportunities that may be possible with this kind of technology? It could be really good for like foreign languages too. If you have like mic chat, you know, you can talk to like native speakers. You know, you can have native um, Spanish speakers teaching a class to a bunch of like Americans who are trying to learn Spanish. Absolutely. Yeah. There's an idea. Absolutely for training for training purposes, right? So show is better than tell, and do is better than show, right? Do it and get the actual sensory repercussions you would get if you were performing the actual surgery. So virtual reality is making inroads in terms of training uh, very high skilled fine motor tasks like surgery, uh, learning an instrument and anything like that. Okay, so that's education. Again, we're all here physically, so VR hasn't made it to education on a large scale yet, but it may be possible. Um, we just talked about uh, medical training. Uh, there is a lot of use of, of this in terms of uh, education for uh, medical uh, pathologies. There's a great example here. This is a, 
um, a snippet from a research paper a few years back about using virtual reality to train students about schizophrenia. For a lot of mental disorders, if you're learning to try and treat someone that suffers from a particular mental disorder, if you yourself don't have that disorder, it is very hard to relate and provide care. So could you create a virtual environment? It may not be a very pleasant one, but it may be as close as possible to what someone who suffers from schizophrenia or delusional disorders might actually experience. And you can then put students in the shoes of what it feels like to suffer from that disorder. Again, not necessarily a pleasant experience, but it could be a very powerful educational experience. You could help to educate the public. So assuming that this system was relatively accessible, we could build up empathy for particular disorders by making it easier for people to put themselves in the shoes of the person that suffers from that uh, pathology. Again, we could use it to train practitioners. Um, what do you actually do when someone who is suffering from schizophrenia has an attack? What does it feel like? What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they feeling? What can you do in that moment uh, to help? And then also you can use it to treat the patients themselves. If you suffer from schizophrenia, for example, um, you can be fitted with a system, again, in the presence uh, of experts, where you can re very gradually turn up the realism. You can implement or turn on an episode and turn it off again. And you can try, if you do this in a systematic way, to desensitize the observer to the effect. One of the things that's most debilitating about mental disorders is lack of control. You have no control over when an episode occurs. Imagine you are instrumented with technology where now you have control. You are holding the knob where you can turn on or off an episode that to you looks familiar of your actual episodes and you have control over the magnitude of realism of that event. You might be able to gradually desensitize yourself to that, uh, to that event. Okay. What else is possible in virtual worlds? Well, uh, the, the law is getting involved. There's some interesting papers in, uh, from legal scholars about virtual worlds. Um, this is, again, one from a few years back. It was kind of interesting. Um, a bunch of law scholars asked questions like, for example, in a virtual world, if you have virtual objects or virtual properties, are they property in the actual legal sense? If you build a beautiful oceanside home in World of Warcraft or Second Life and I come along and knock it down, am I liable? It's not real, doesn't matter, does it? I guess it depends on like the permanence of those creations because like a lot of servers have like regular wipes and updates that clear things out anyway. That's true. Let's assume that they're permanent. If I built it in this virtual world, it's there until I turn it off. It could have like real world effects. Like I know sometimes things in video games, when people use video game currency or digital money, like Steam Online is a big example of that. Absolutely, right? So real world consequences like money, for example. So if I pay real money and buy this virtual property in this virtual world, or buy the materials and make it in the virtual world, I use real money. So property in a legal sense is property if you use real money to buy it or create it. And assuming that it doesn't instantaneously decay, it retains that value. Something has value if you pay real money for it. And if sometime later you can sell it to someone for about the same amount, that's proof that that thing retained its value. If it has value and retains it, it's property, regardless of whether it's virtual or physical. If you go look up the legal definition of property, it says nothing about physical property. I mean, but that would be the same as, say, like buying a really expensive whatever and then leaving it outside for anybody to come along and steal it. Ah, if you buy something in a virtual world and you leave it unattended, maybe you are liable if it gets stolen. Or it's your fault. Okay. Think about the legal implications of virtual worlds. You have a quiz due tonight, interim video two due tomorrow night, and I will see you on Thursday. Um, I also will not be holding my office hours tomorrow on Wednesday, but I will have my office hours 
on Thursday.